Amen. Let's all stand up and let's read our verse for today. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 23 to 24, it says there, Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Each day proclaim the good news that He saves. Publish His glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing thing He does. Amen? Amen. Let's all come and worship our God.
church.
says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends those who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good or the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry, but those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. Come, my children who listen and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Amen. Does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. He will erase their memory from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call to him for help. He rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. For the Lord protects the bones of the righteous. Not one of them is broken. Calamity will surely overtake the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be punished. But the Lord will redeem those who serve him. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word. Your word brings life. God, your word also says what a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a holy God. God, teach us to fear you. Teach us the path of righteousness. Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Father. For all of our worldly ways. Forgive us for all the idols in our lives. Forgive us for all the distractions, for the busyness. Forgive us, Lord, for the things that we've made it when it's all about you. Lord, we bless your name. We give you praise and we give you glory, Jesus. Amen. to read this everybody shout for joy to the Lord all the earth worship the Lord with gladness come before him with joyful songs know that the Lord is God it is he who made us and we are his we are his people the sheep of his pastor enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise give thanks to him and praise his name for the Lord is good and his love and verse forever his faithfulness continues through all generations. Everything that's said in front today is true and living and active in all of us. All we need is to surrender. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So, brace yourself today. We will receive the blessing. We will receive the Holy Spirit in each and every one of us. All we need to do is surrender everything. Amen. So, praise God. Let's give a clap offering again. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. All right. So let's let's call on the kids. Kids, we we'll pray for you. Amen. At parang alulukot niyo, ha? Yon. All right. That's everything. Uh, I didn't play. But... Sige. All right. Who's the teacher today? All right. She's. 
She's joyous. Praise God. <laughs> so again, let's all uh, raise our hands and pray for the kids. All right, let's pray. Lord, hallelujah, Lord God. Truly, your love endures forever, Lord God. Even to the generation, from generation to generation. We pray for this generation, for the kids' generation right now, Lord God, that you bless them, you empower them, you continue, Lord God, to prosper them and give them wisdom through their teachers, through their parents, Lord God, so that in the next generation, Lord God, to come, that they will impart your words and your love truly in the hearts of people, your people, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, for uh, Lord God, for the teachers who will guide them, teach them, Lord God, uh, train them, Lord God, that they, when they grow up, Lord God, they will impart it in their hearts, Lord God, and never, never leave, uh, 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 leave them, Lord God, to impart it deeper in their hearts, Lord God, that they can share your words to other people, to other generation, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for this wonderful gift that you have given to their parents, to the church, Lord God. Truly, Lord God, this is uh, overwhelming for all of us, Lord God, that kids are growing and growing, Lord God. And we see the fruit, Lord God, of the labor of the teachers and the parents in the church, Lord God. We bless them, we honor them, Lord God, we surrender everything them to you, Lord God, because you are our creator, you are our father, Lord God. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you, kids. See you later. Hallelujah. So, before we call on the... to continue the message today, I would like to call on... Who's uh, the announcer today? Paolo. Amen. Praise God. Paolo. Let's give a clap offering. Come on. Amen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Morning. So, for our uh, Isaac offerings, let's read the uh, Second Corinthians chapter nine, verses six to nine. Uh, remember this: a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Seven, you must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And nine, as the scripture says, uh, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Amen. So, uh, one general thing uh, we can understand through this uh, chapter is uh, uh, through these verses that uh, we should give generously. Are we generous givers? Amen. So, uh, how can we become generous givers? How how can how do we give? Uh, there's an easy way to remember. We can use an acronym. To the word give, and that is uh, G generous, generously, I individually, B voluntarily, and E expectantly. So for uh, give generously, it says in the chapter uh, verse six that uh, on the on the passage that you read, God loves generous generous generosity, for He is a generous giver also. So alam naman natin lahat yan. Uh, Jesus modeled generous giving in Isaiah 12. If we follow his model, we will ultimately become a generous, uh, generous givers. Uh, of our top, uh, not just uh, monetary, but also uh, give to give our talents and uh, time and uh, treasure. Amen. Uh, and next, you uh, individually in chapter uh, in verse seven. Uh, giving is an individual choice, privilege, and responsibility. No one else can make it for us. So, uh, yeah, giving must come individually for, from the heart and uh, for the Lord. Amen. And number three, uh, voluntarily, also in chapter <coughs> in verse 7, we should give willingly and cheerfully. Uh, the principle is we reap as we sow, 
but with the right motives. Yes. So we should be doing it and, uh, unto the Lord. If you are just uh, forced to give, then do, don't do it, but wait unto the Lord to give you a right heart. Amen. So we should pray for, for us to have a right heart. So really, uh, it's really uh, uh, better to be joyful at your giving. Uh, and the last one, expectantly, 2 Corinthians uh, yung, uh, verses 8 and 9. So, when we give in grace, God is good to give back more than we would expect. We will give good deeds unto the Lord. We can expect uh, that God will provide us with the ability for us to do more. Amen. Uh, uh, another way to one way to express uh, our love is uh, is to volunteer our treasure and time and talent. Uh, I'd like to share also two defining statements from Jesus on the topic of giving. Uh, the first one is give and it will be given to you. The second one is it is more blessed to give than to receive. Amen. Uh, for the first one in Luke six thirty eight it says. Uh, Give it, it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, uh, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So, we don't just give in order for us to receive, right? Uh, but uh, we give it to the Lord. When we give it to the Lord, we will mostly, uh, will most surely give back the measure of the more than uh, I mean, he will most surely give back the measure of the more than we could imagine. We can outgive the Lord. Right? Amen. Uh, when we give, we receive his outpouring. Uh, and yeah, we can out outgive the Lord. It says in Malachi 3. Right? We give because we want to obey God's word and we want to honor him. Generosity in giving will result in greater reward or blessing from God even uh, when we do not look for it or expect it. Amen. And the uh, last one, it's more blessed to give than to receive. It's in uh, Acts 20, verse 35. In everything I did, I showed you that, that by this kind of hard work, we must keep the weak, remembering the word. The Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So generous people are very, very blessed people. They, bless, they are blessed because they, there is joy. Uh, in in their giving, uh, to enjoy the benefits of God's promise, we must exercise faith and obedience in giving generously, unselfishly, and sacrificially. God blesses our giving uh, to become channels of His blessings to bless others. Amen. So uh, let's uh, have a short prayer for our tithes and offering. Uh, hallelujah, Lord uh, Jesus, our generous and loving God. We thank you for the blessings and uh, provisions that we continue to we continue to receive from you, Lord. Even though there are times that we don't deserve it, still your generosity is uh, unfailing. Uh, we offer you thanks and praise as we recognize that all we receive comes from you, Lord. Uh, please guide us as stewards of your abundance, and may we take good care of all you have entrusted to us, Lord. Amen. And with thankful hearts and with uh, that faithful stewardship will be will bear witness to our to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So for our tithes and offerings, we can do it in two ways. First one, uh, donation boxes at the back uh, beside the entrance door, and the second one is uh, through e-transfer uh, using the email donations at the Nova Scotia Church. Ah, that church. <coughs> and special announcement. Uh, junior Youth and Youth Fellowship this Friday, May 18th, 7 p.m. at the church. So we're asking the parents of the youth, if able, to... For this Friday? Oh, okay, correction. Only young, young from for this Friday. Okay. For those who can help with the rights, uh, please, uh, please tell us. Uh, Win Church Canada Conference in Toronto. The theme is Increase in Christ. It is on July 31st to August 2nd. Let's be excited. For all those who are not registered yet, please do so. And June 30th, 
June 30 is the deadline for the registration. So, I just will register. Uh, worship team retreat, May 31st to June 1st. Amen. At Fort Card Marriott is in uh, Dartmouth. Registration is $10 for food. $10. And sec uh, another one, uh, War Room every Friday. We are inviting everyone to join. Saturday. 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 <laughs> <laughs> War Room every Saturday morning, 5, 5 a.m. We are inviting everyone to join the prayer ministry of War Room. Scheduled every Saturday at 5 p.m. 5 a.m. 5 a.m. Brother Sandro, first time, excited, excited, excited. Last one, last one. We will hold our annual members meeting hosted by our board of directors and pastors, May 26. Next week. Next week. Next week. Uh, 1 p.m. after the service. So there's an option to participate via Zoom for those who cannot come in person. And after the meeting, we, we will have lunch fellowship for those who can stay. We'll be happy to see you and have fellowship. Ayan, that's why I'm coming. Last one, last one. Wind leaders. Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, well, let's give a clap offering. We understand from. Yeah. It's his first time, but. Truly, bro, thank you for your uh, your patience. <laughs> Amen. So, uh, I also invite you, brothers and sisters, after the the worship uh, retreat on June 1, uh, 4 p.m., we will have our first leadership training for the, for the, it's like for the, not just for the leaders. Amen. For the servant leaders that are willing to be to serve uh, the church. So we will have our servant leadership training um, uh, entitled Empowering Servant Leaders. So this is a uh, special event that we will we will know what a real servant leader is. Amen? So we will understand what's the goal and what's our what's the motive that we will lead. We will be leaders. We are, Tabinga, we are all leaders. Amen? But this is important for us to uh, to know to know how how it works with the in, in, in a godly perspective so i encourage you to join to join us here in the church for 4 p.m uh june 1 amen so praise god thank you and anything else so praise god uh before we uh hear the message today anyone who wants to give thanks and praise the lord Ano po ba? Ha? Renan? Renan daw? Amen? Ha? Oh. Bolan to. Pagkaligyan sa aming pamilya dahil salamat po sa prayer ko ninyo. Ayun po yung family po ng buo at Amen! Ang ilang taon na bilongin po kami sa kanila. Ito na po yung dinignan. Dinignan na po talaga ni Lord yung pananamin po namin. Salamat po sa Panginoon talaga kasi din po sa struggle yung uh, pagpunta nila dito pero uh, wala pong makatigil talaga sa answered prayer ng Panginoon. Uh, yun po, pagkatiwalaan lang po natin yung Panginoon at lagi po natin uh, i-claim yung mga gusto po natin uh, na kami po matupad na galing po sa Kanya. Basta po maghintay lang po tayo sa tamang panahon na ibibigay po niya. Alam po po na Hindi ko man po mapasalamatan bawat isa, pero salamat po talaga sa prayer po ninyo. Isa po kayo sa mga malaking bagay na uh, naging inspirasyon po namin para madala po talaga namin yung mga bata dito. Kaya 
Salamat po sa mga tumulong, sa mga nag-pray, talaga pong pinabalik ko po ang kahulit-hulit. Pasalamat sa Diyos. Amen. Uh, natutuwa po kami kasi alam po namin na napaka, ano po, napaka hirap din po ba talaga yung uh, galing sila dito. Ngayon ko po kasi naranasan yung pamising ng madaling araw talaga pa. <laughs> Pag-prepare sa pagkain nila dahil bumalik na po sila sa school. Nag-start up po sila noong Monday. Kaya, Pasalamat po. Legit na tatay ka na ngayon. Ito po na-feel yung pagiging tatay ka na ngayon. Sabi ko nga po sa sarili ko, kahit na parang fried egg lang, pag-isalamatan ka ng anak mo, napakasarap ko po. Yes! Masaya po, masaya po. Ganyan po yung... Sa trabaho, parang... Kahit dalawang oras lang ang tulog mo, kahit walang tulog, okay lang. Kasi buwi mo sa bahay, makikita mo yung anak mo kahit pagod ka. Kaya ko, pinabalik ko po ang kukulit. Pasalamat sa Diyos, bakit ko po mag-ubos sa aking boses. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Truly, God is good. Amen? God is good all the time. So, He, never, he will never uh, let... His people, His family set apart. Amen? So, thank you, no? Anyone else? Ayun. Si Tanya, may siya sabihin? Ha? Sure? Pa, gusto mo? Uh, anyways, no? Uh, actually, kapapaan na lang natin, no? Si, si Sailin. May pinyata nga na si Sailin, eh. Ha? Ha? Mother! We miss you! Welcome back! Amen! Praise God for your life! I think the last the last time we saw each other sa Mount St. Vincent pa. Amen! Praise God! The mother of uh, Sis Eileen is here. Yeah. And Brother Chris, welcome back. Amen! So, praise God. Anyone else? Last one. Who wants to give thanks and praise the Lord? Malana? All right, so I guess I'm not going to preach today. It's my day off. Praise God. So I would like to call on Brother Eric. You will share the word today. Let's give a clap of All right, bro. Praise God. Oh, you want the other one? Okay. Good morning. Morning. How are you guys doing? Good. How good is good? All the time. Really good. Skip. One to ten. How good? Ten. Hey. Amen. <laughs> Hope that stays the same. <laughs> uh, I just want to say that uh, I just want to comment on Paolo sharing. I uh, I had planned on doing a short sharing on tithing this morning before the message. And uh, Paolo beat me to it. <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing about, about that sharing was uh, this morning when I was in the shower, I often pray when I'm in the shower. I hope you don't think that's weird, but I do. And uh, when I was asking the Lord about sharing about tithing, two scripture verses came to my mind. And he quoted them both this morning. So, Amen, Holy Spirit. Amen, Amen. God is good. So, um, we hear messages on tithing very often. And I almost think sometimes when we hear things often, we get desensitized to the message. And... I just want to make it clear, we're, we're not trying to browbeat people into, into tithing, okay? Uh, there is a reality that it costs money to run a church. There is a reality that the rent has to be paid, that salaries have to be paid, um, and we also need to do the work of the ministry. Because the main reason we're here is because there's souls that need to get saved. Amen. There's people that need to get discipled. There's outreach that needs to be done. 
There's the poor that need to be fed. There's families who are struggling that need money. And we can't do those things if we don't have money. And please understand me, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and we're, as the, the scripture verse says, we're not to give out of compulsion. We're to give from a joyful heart because not we're being told to do it, but because of what Jesus has done for us. Amen? Amen. So, I can sit here and tell you testimonies all day long about the goodness of God as it relates to giving. As the old saying goes, you cannot outgive God. Okay? And if you're not giving generously, and I'm not saying that that's the case, but if you're not giving generously, you're hurting yourself. Because... It is in giving that it's given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. God is a good God. Think about it this way. The tithe is a seed. Okay, If you're, if you're believing God for prosperity, if you're believing God for blessings in your life, okay, when you plant seeds in obedience to God, those seeds have the potential to produce a large harvest and multiply. There's a principle of seed time and harvest where when you plant a seed, you plant it in fertile soil and you give it time, it will produce a harvest in season. So even, it, it actually is counterintuitive in a way. If you're struggling financially, give. Give. Because in giving, you're planting that seed. And you're opening the door for God to give back to you. So, that's probably not a way you've heard it taught before, but I can testify, and I think many people here can testify, that when you give, okay, in obedience to God, He will bless you. He will bless you and bless you and bless you. I've experienced it so many times. Amen? Amen. Anyway, that has nothing to do with the message today. Sorry about that. I digress. So, um, the, the theme for today's message comes from uh, two scripture verses. One in Matthew 24 and the other in 1 Chronicles 7.13. We all know these scriptures very well. We've heard them probably many times. Uh, but I just want to uh, set the stage for the main part of the message so the, the title of the message is, Are You Ready? So Matthew 24, before we start, I'm just going to pray. Father, uh, I just want to thank you for your word. Your word is meant to bring life, and life abundantly. You said you've given us everything that we need for life and godliness. Lord, this is your word, it's not my word. Father, I'm praying that if... Um, there's any misunderstanding, any misinterpretation of the things I'm about to share, Father. I am open to your correction. I'm open to your teaching and your leading. Uh, I only want to impart truth on people, Lord. It is your word, Lord God. I'm praying, Jesus, that uh, you would give the hearers an ear to hear. And Lord, open all of our hearts and open all of our minds to the truth uh, contained in this message. So I pray, Father, that your word, you say, will accomplish the purpose for which you sent it, that it will not return void. So, Father, we come together in faith right now, believing that your word will not return void, that it will accomplish the purpose for which you're sending it. Father, I am just your servant, Lord. I am nobody. I am just asking, Father, that you would quiet my mind and quiet my voice in favor of your voice, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 24, I would like to also encourage everybody to turn your phones off and just hear the Word of God. Uh, we get so distracted sometimes by our phones and things like that. This is a really uh, important message, I believe. I'd uh, love for you to hear it, all of it. And the other thing I want to encourage everybody, I brought my Bible today for the first time and I don't even know how long. Uh, I would encourage everybody to start bringing their Bible in their hands in church. There's just no, no substitute for having the Word of God in your hand, to be able to turn the pages, to be able to study it. Uh, it's powerful. 
Matthew 24, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And just to preface this, this was a time at the end of Jesus' life on earth. He was about to go to the cross, and this was one of his final teachings to the, to the disciples. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another, that it shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for the, all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Right now and throughout the church age, you've seen many wars and rumors of wars. We now have senseless wars raging in Ukraine and Israel. We have tensions with other nations, even China and the Philippines, China and Taiwan. There's tensions and rumors of wars. We're currently experiencing this scripture verse, the wars of rumors and wars in various regions around the world. It seems in the last few years, tensions between nations and tensions within nations are increasing in number and intensity. Most of these conflicts are simply politically motivated, driven by man's thirst for power and profit. Matthew 24, 7 to 8, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these things are, key, word, key verse, the beginning of sorrows. In 2023, there were 1,712 earthquakes with five magnitude or greater. We just experienced a worldwide pandemic, pestilence, COVID-19, and we're now under threat of a new pandemic and a global initiative to give our sovereignty regarding our bodily autonomy to the authority of the World Health Organization. If all the countries vote yes on May 27th, then we'll have moved one step closer to the mark of the beast, the one world government that it speaks about in Revelation. Matthew 24, 9 and 10. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. In the world today, we're seeing unprecedented division and hatred in our society. People are being divided against each other through the media and through entertainment, and culture is inventing reasons to disagree with each other and fight with each other. We may be under the illusion that we have religious freedom here, but please remember, Christians are being persecuted all around the world, every day. Hundreds of millions of Christians are persecuted every year because of their faith. Matthew 24, 11 and 12, then many false prophets will arise and deceive many. You're seeing that right now, you're seeing the doctrines of false preachers preaching a false grace message, preaching, preaching a prosperity gospel that is not accurate, okay? And it's designed to deceive many and remove pe people from God's grace. This was happening actually at the time this scripture verse was, was, was written. Paul preached a lot in, uh, in, in the epistles about, about false teachers coming in and, and sharing a false gospel. So this is not new. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. In Romans chapter 1, uh, the Bible talks about when people are actively living in unbelief, actively living in sin, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. Okay, so people's heart, when people are sinning, when people are continuously living against God's principles, God gives them over to a reprobate mind. 
The result of that is an indifference towards God, an indifference towards sin, an indifference towards doing the things of God. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. We live in the information age, the age of TikTok, Facebook, social media. Never before in world history has it been so easy to get information that it is today. The gospel message has never been more widely accessible to someone who wants to hear it. Although there are still some people groups in the world who have not heard the gospel, most have heard it. Jesus here is telling us that when the gospel has been preached to the whole world, then the end will come. So it's perfectly reasonable to assume that we are not a long way from the second coming of Jesus Christ. So we can make a reasonable conclusion that the second coming of the Lord is close, and the question is, are you ready? In this passage, in Matthew 24, Jesus is talking about two separate events. He's, the disciples unknowingly ask Jesus two questions, but not completely. He answers both questions, but not completely. He explains what will take place in both events and what will be the signs that each event will happen. The two events described here are the destruction of the Jewish temple and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in my view, uh, and I'm open to be corrected if I'm wrong, but in my, in my personal view, they thought that that was one and the same event. So the conversation between Jesus and his disciples took place around AD 30, and it was approximately 40 years later, uh, sometime around AD 70, that the first prophecy came to pass. Jesus was making a, a prophetic announcement to the disciples uh, so that they would know okay, what, what is to come. So the, the temple was destroyed in AD 70, and the first pro prophecy came to pass. The Romans destroyed the Jewish temple. The rest of the passage we just read, read talks about the second coming of Christ. As we see, it specifically talks about the signs that believers will see that will point to the imminent return of Christ. So the conclusion here is, is that Jesus returned. I, I'm just trying to establish here in your minds and in your hearts that the signs are pointing to the fact that the return of Christ is close at hand. Now, whether it's one day or 10 years or 20 years, honestly, it's not really relevant. We should always be ready. The Bible says that it's for every man to die and face judgment. Okay, We will all face Christ. Judgment begins in the house of God. That's what the Bible says. So at the end of this passage, Jesus tells two parables. And both parables are admonishing believers to be prepared for his coming. So the main theme of this message today is, are you ready? We are living in an unprecedented time and season. We've never experienced in our lifetime the kinds of things that we're now seeing unfold in culture before our eyes. We've seen COVID-19 ravage the world, severely damaging people's health, even taking people's lives, destroying their finances, destroying businesses, and destroying the family. Many have lost loved ones. It has devastated the economy uh, on a global basis. The result has been record inflation. We've never seen gas prices so high at two dollars, almost two dollars a liter. Business owners are devastated beyond the ability to recover. We're seeing people on the streets all over Halifax, all over the country. People living on the streets in record numbers, unable to afford rent. A housing crisis affecting a vast number of people. Food banks running out of food, unable to keep up with the demand. We have record number of people visiting food banks. On other fronts, families are breaking down. Divorce is at an all-time high. Kids rebelling against their parents. Parents losing the authority to make key decisions for kids. 
Parents are overworked, overstressed, have not enough time for their kids. Kids are now being raised by social media, video games, and their, and their peers. Teenagers are being forced into activities through peer pressure and social media that are ruining their lives and their future. As we've discussed before, there are wars and rumors of wars, nations rising up against nations, earthquakes and famines in different parts of the world, and the love of money, love of many is growing cold. Does this sound familiar? In Matthew 24, Jesus talks of these things and tells us not to fear. For the end is not yet. These things are the beginning of sorrows. So the encouragement here is we know if we are born again, if we are blood washed, if we are redeemed, if we are forgiven, our kingdom is not of this world. We're not citizens of earth. We're citizens of heaven. In other words, all these things happening in the world today are signs, as described in Matthew 24, as the beginning of sorrow. So because we are seeing all these events, it points to the fact that the world is heading towards the great tribulation and soon to follow after the coming of the king. This is the part we put our hope in. But during the great tribulation, the wrath of God will be poured out on the world. Now we can debate whether or not we will experience the rapture before or after or mid-tribulation, but it really matters very little. We can all agree that we will meet the Lord yes. one day, and we must be ready, no matter when that day is. So what shall we do to prepare for and cope with what is happening around the world to, today to us? The first thing that Jesus commanded us in the Bible hundreds of times. Do not be afraid. I'm not telling you these things to cause fear. I'm telling you these things so that we're aware of the times that we live in. If we're aware, we can prepare. So my prayer for the church right now is for the revelation of the fear of the Lord. And for a spirit of repentance, both personally as believers and corporately as the body of Christ, we need to repent, and we need to come back to our first love. I hear often people praying for revival, and revival is good, It'd be very good, but honestly, I don't read in the Bible that at the end times there's going to be a great revival. I don't read that. What I read in the Bible is, it says that the love of many will grow cold. It says, Jesus talking said, will, when I return, will I even find faith on the earth? So revival would be wonderful, but as believers, we need to recognize the times and season we're living in. The Bible says there will be a great falling away. If we're to be ready for the Lord's return, we must turn back to Him now while there's still time. If we're to see God move in our land, if we want to experience God's protection, if we want to see order restored and healing in our land, it must start in the church. Seeking the Lord through praying, fasting, believing, and repenting. The Bible says in, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. This passage is very familiar to us. We've all heard it many, many times. And most have heard it too many times to count. We've heard it quoted, but have we understood it? This verse holds the key for the believer and also the key for the church to be ready to meet the Lord. For the church at large, the Bible says, 
Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Right now, we live in a godless country, a godless society. We used to be a Christian nation, not anymore. God here clearly lays out the foundation of what is required for both for believers, both individually and corporately, to receive God's forgiveness, his blessing, his protection, his provision. So let's look at this more closely. In the first passage, the first phrase is, if my people. That's ref in, the, in the text, it's referring to the children of Israel, uh, or God's chosen people. In our case, the Bible says that we have been grafted into the tree. So now we are his people, if we are born again. Therefore, if, if you're born again, you have a and if you have a relationship with Jesus, you're now included in the my people. We are God's people, the children of God, if we have given our lives and to Christ and put our faith and trust in Him. The first question we must ask ourselves is if we are to endure to the end is, am I a child of God? Many people come to church every Sunday. They confess that Jesus is Lord. But do our lives really reflect this reality? Do you make Bible reading, prayer, worship, fellowship, a priority in your life every day? Do you have a desire to know God and seek God? Have you changed as a result of your faith? Can the world look at, at you and say, you're different? We need to be sure that we are his people who are called by his name. The next phrase, who are called by my name, simply refers to the fact that God has called us. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. He has called us into a right relationship with him. This is accomplished by grace, through faith, not by works. It is a gift from God. The Lord is calling us to a personal relationship with him, to be consecrated to him, to put the Lord first in our lives. That means that the Lord is our first love, our first priority, our highest priority. Number three, would humble themselves and pray. Humbling in this case means to fast and to pray. In the Bible, when humbling ourselves is being spoken of, it's talking about uh, fasting. Fasting is a lost art of the church. Fasting is the afflicting of the soul. It's going without food for an extended period for a spiritual purpose. Actually, many faiths, not just Christians, fast as part of their, uh, part of their religious activity. In our case, we are not fasting out of compulsion. We're not fasting out of religion. We're fasting because we want to afflict our souls. We want to get close to God. We want to tune into His frequency. We, want, we do this to bring the soul into submission to the Spirit so the Spirit can be the dominant part of our being. We humble ourselves to subdue our flesh so we can have a closer intimacy with the Lord. Understand that fasting alone without prayer is just a diet. Amen. But fasting with prayer is very powerful, but it's how we get closer intimacy with the Lord. When I think I spoke about Matthew 17 the last time I talked, where Jesus came off the mountain and, and the disciples couldn't cast out the demon. And he said, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. There's a power that, that can be attained through fasting and prayer which is consecration, which is totally immersing yourself with God. Understand that fasting does not move God. Fasting moves us closer to God. So we can hear His voice and obey what He tells us. In doing this, we pray according to His will. And it is then we experience the power of God. We humble ourselves, we empty ourselves, so He can fill us with Himself. The result is an empowered, victorious Christian life. The apostles modeled this in Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 14. When after the Lord ascended into heaven, they all went to the upper room to fast and pray and wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. And I just want to add here, 
You know, when Jesus was on top of the mountain, when he was about to ascend to heaven, there was 500 people there. That's what the word tells us. He said, go to Jerusalem and wait to be endowed with power from on high. Now, the next part of the text tells us that 120 people were in the upper room. So my question is, what happened to the, to the other 380? So these people knew Jesus. They knew him. They walked with him. They followed him. They learned from him. And then he said, go and be endowed with power from on high. And only 120 of the 500 responded. Why? Because the other 380 likely were not willing to pay the, the cost. The cost of having real being a disciple, Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, pick up your cross daily and follow me. The life of a disciple is a sacrifice. It's a sacrificial life. It's denying yourself in favor of God. Emptying yourself so God can fill you with himself. So prayer and fasting are keys to living the life of a true disciple. It's the key to living a life of intimacy. And it's a key to doing the work of the ministry. Without a lifestyle of prayer and fasting, we're just not going to see the miracle signs and wonders. Number four, the phrase, and, and seek my face. The Bible says we must seek the Lord. This is an essential part of being in relationship with the Lord. We must continually be seeking the Lord. If we're not having regular encounters, regular communication with the Lord, then we need to stop and seek Him with all of our hearts. Seek Him and you will find Him when you seek Him with all of your heart. 1 Chronicles 16, 10-11 says, Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek in the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. 2 Chronicles 15, 2. The Lord is with you while you are with Him. If you seek Him, He will be found by you. But if you forsake Him, He will forsake you. Psalm 9, 9 and verse 10. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Amen. Psalm 105 verse 4. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. Psalm 119, verse 2. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. There are many more scriptures I can quote instructing believers to continually seek the Lord. I want to be very clear on this particular point. It is not a one-time event to come to church, have an emotional experience, Pray the sinner's prayer, and then you're good to go. No more effort required. That's not the gospel. The Bible says repent and believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be baptized, and then you will be saved. The sinner's prayer is a good starting point if it's meant sincerely with understanding. But it's not actually in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible will you see the sinner's prayer. It says to repent, believe, and be baptized. The Bible also says to work out your salvation daily with fear and trembling. Number five, turn from their wicked ways. Again, this is a huge point. Preceding any revival that's ever happened in history, there was great repentance. The Bible says godly sorrow produces godly repentance. We must repent. Repentance comes from the word metanoia, which means a change of mind. Leading, leading to a change of attitude, leading to a change of behavior. If you say you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ but live like the world, 
You're deceived. I'm sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> it's his word. It's not mine. Sure. There has to be change. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear. The Lord is asking us for an attitude of repentance. And it, it, it should be continual. You know, the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, as we get our minds renewed, okay, change, like the process of sanctification happens over time. But the attitude needs to be, I want to be like Jesus. I want to obey Jesus. I want to turn from my sin. doesn't mean you're not going to sin. It just means that as you sin, you have this continual attitude of repentance. The Bible says, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. The gospel without repentance is not the gospel. You must repent, turn from the old life, and put on Christ. Chapter, John chapter 15 says, As long as you abide in me and my word abides in you, you will produce much fruit. But any branch that does not pr produce fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. Abiding in Him means continuous seeking, communication with, communion with, uh, prayer, fasting, reading His Word, obeying His voice. And as we abide in Him, He will produce fruit in us, through us. But the fruit comes from the abiding. We do not have to tell a tree to produce apples. It's just what it does. It's its nature. So when we are born again... Our nature changes. It goes from being worldly toward God. All things have passed away. All things become new. His spirit regenerates our spirit so that we have the nature of God living inside of us. So as the branch is connected to the vine you will be connected to Christ. And the same passage tells us that the branch not producing fruit, again, will be cut off and thrown in the fire. This is serious. Jesus expects his believers, his children, to be fruitful. So to repeat, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. At the end of this passage is a wonderful promise. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. His promise of forgiveness, of healing the land, comes with the condition of seeking him, repenting, and being in right relationship with him. Jesus said, if you love me, what? If you love me, what? Obey my commands. Obedience is the key to right relationship with the Lord. So the promises are there, but the keys to receiving the promise are living a lifestyle of prayer, seeking, fasting, repentance, and finally obedience. We must come to the Lord honestly and allow Him to change our hearts. Can we bring the pianist back? As I was praying this morning, actually yesterday morning, sorry, I felt the Lord impress upon me this scripture. In Revelation 3, starting at verse 4, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, Now keep in mind, this is Jesus talking to believers. He's talking to the church. These things I say, these things say the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. Then, because you are, so then because you're lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. 
Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you, buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on the throne, as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This scripture verse where it says, as many as I love, I, I rebuke, I chasten. One day I prayed a very stupid prayer. I said, Lord, how come you don't chasten me? Things were going good. I felt like I was on top of the world. Business was good. Marriage was good. Life was good. And I prayed, I prayed this prayer. And then, <laughs> fasten your seatbelt. I got chastened. And it wasn't pleasant. But you know, most people here have children. When the Lord chastens us, He chastens us because He loves us. He corrects us because He loves us. There's no parent here that would not like to see your child be prosperous, be healthy, be successful, have good character, have good morals, be loving, be kind, be giving, be servant-minded, be a leader. Every parent here wants this for their children. The Lord Jesus Christ is a good God. He's faithful. I came to the Lord at 42 years old. I've been running from God all my life. I was into every kind of sin imaginable. And what I know about that is the pleasures of sin are fleeting. It may feel good for a moment, but inevitably what happens is you come up empty. Our hearts are designed to be filled with Jesus Christ. For the love of God was shed abroad in your hearts. There's no other thing. There's no other reason to live. This world and everything in it will pass away, but His word will by no means pass away. The greatest things are faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And there is no other love like the love of Jesus. So I would encourage everybody here. And to be honest with you guys, this message probably spoke more to me than anybody else in the, in the room here. You know, maybe this message wasn't even for you, it was for me. <laughs> but... I know that we all get busy, we all get, you know, wrapped up in our problems, we all get, you know, marital issues that we have to deal with, we all have health issues that we have to deal with sometimes, but we are not citizens of this world, we are citizens of heaven, and we need to be ready.
As we see in these uh, passages, the Lord is expecting our total devotion to Him. You know, I uh, I heard it explained once. When we are a child of God, when we're living in submission and obedience and communion with Him, when we're living in His grace, we have this protection over us, over our lives. We have this shield of protection. And when we step outside the will of God, when we disobey, when we ignore Him, when we, when we don't do what He's asked us to do, that protection is removed. And you open up the door to all kinds of nastiness. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But the Lord comes to give life and life abundantly. It doesn't matter what we acquire. We're not taking it with us. This life is but a vapor. If you were to imagine the size of your life compared to eternity, it's like one speck of sand of all the seashore, of every, every seashore in the universe. It's nothing. But yet we spend all of our time, all of our focus, all of our energy trying to make this little speck, this little vapor, as pleasurable as possible. We're funny people, you know. If you look at the logic in it, it really is not very logical. But that's what we do. And the Lord knows us. It's not enough just to believe. I want you to hear this. It is not enough just to believe. The gospel requires a response. The proof that you are born again that you're in right relationship with the Lord is that there's a change in your desires, a change of heart, a change of what you allow your eyes to behold and your ears to be exposed to. What kind of music do you listen to? What kind of videos do you watch? What kind of things do you look at on Facebook? A change in your morality. A change in your priorities. Here in Revelation, the Lord rebukes the church for being a lukewarm church with a very strong warning. But then he issues an invitation. Dining with the Jewish people is like a sacred event. It was a very important time in the daily lives of Jewish believers. It was greatly cherished by Jewish families. It was an intimate time for family to gather and have fellowship. Jesus is saying here that he's inviting you and I to a life of intimacy with him. Where we can have fellowship with him and really know him. Knowing him and him knowing you is the key to eternal life. Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not perform many miracles in your name? I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Get away from me, you evildoers. So how does this relate to our first scripture? When Jesus spoke of the signs of the times. If we care to take an honest look at our lives. If we care to look honestly at what we're seeing around us in the world. We will see that most, if not all, the signs that point to the soon return of Jesus are happening around us right now. Right now is a crucial time for the church, for believers to repent and come to Jesus fully committed to him, not half-heartedly. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him 
and he with me. First, individually and as a corporate body, we must pray. The Bible says that my house shall be called a house of prayer. There is no revival without prayer. There is no manifest presence of God without prayer. We must seek a life of intimacy with Him. In doing this, we'll be positioning ourselves to receive personal revival and corporate revival. We will also be ready when we meet him. Whether it be at a second coming or when we die a natural death and meet him, the reality is we will meet him. The Bible says that the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. question for all of us is, am I ready to meet the Lord Jesus? If that moment was right now, the Bible says that the Lord is long-suffering, but he's not forever suffering. The day will come where we will die and we will face judgment. And at that time, it will be too late. There's no do-overs. Our eternal destination, heaven or hell, will be determined by whether or not we put our faith and trust in Him and we continually have a relationship and seek Him. It was said by the Apostle James, I will show you my faith by my works. Genuine faith produces good works. It produces fruit. A change from the old to the new. Putting on the character and nature of Christ. So do we want to be sure that we are saved? Do we want to see our loved ones saved? Do we want his protection and provision? Do we want to see a revival? Do we want to experience God personally? Do we want to see miracle signs and wonders? Do we want to hear his voice? Do we want our prayers answered? We must seek him. We must fast and pray. We must repent. Remember, I really struggle with this message. And to be honest with all of you guys, this message fully applies to me. I'm not uh, better than anybody here. Please. I, it's one thing to understand the scripture. It's another to apply it. And uh, there's areas of my life where I need to do better. But this is a call back to our first love. God is love. <coughs> but God is also holy. His name is Holy Spirit. If there's things in your life that um, you need to let go of, if there's things in your life you need to repent of, if there's things in your life, if you're one of these people that, yeah, I believe, I believe, but I'm not going to make any changes in my life. I'm not going to give up anything. If you're one of those people, I would really encourage you to really think about what that decision looks like. My wife was very, uh, she's very wise, and, and she said something very powerful to me one day. 
We are all a slave to something. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to become a Christian because I don't want to give up stuff. I don't want to... I don't want to have to be, you know, a holy roller. I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to have to give up, you know, this or that or something else. Okay. So the Bible says we are either slaves of sin leading to death. Or we are a slave of righteousness that leads to eternal life. So, if there's anyone that would like to really commit their lives to Jesus today, just stand. Amen. If you'd like to repent of anything, you don't have to tell anybody what it is between you and God. If you want to repent, just stand. If you want to turn back to Jesus, just stand. If you want to put him first, just stand. Amen. Father, me personally, Lord, I just want to say I'm sorry. Sorry, Lord, for... Uh, all the busyness, all the distractions. Lord, forgive me for all the things in my life that are not pleasing to you. Lord God, thank you for those who are standing right now. I'm praying, Jesus, that you would meet them at their point of desire. Father, we know that you are so quick to forgive. I feel... I just feel also to say if there's anyone in your life that you haven't forgiven you need to forgive those people um, the Bible says forgive lest you be forgiven and if you're not willing to forgive I can't forgive you so Lord help us to forgive those we need to forgive Lord I pray for this revelation of the fear of the Lord. You said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, you say don't fear man who can kill the body, but fear the Lord who has the power to cast the body and the soul into hell. Amen. Lord, help us to know you. Help us to really know you. And help us, Lord, to just give our lives fully to you. In Jesus' name. All right, that's a uh, half. Thank you, bro. That's a powerful message for each and every one of us. Not just applied for Brother Eric, but even to me. And I believe for all of us, right? So if you want to surrender everything to the Lord, this is the time. Like I said, we will meet our Creator. But the thing is, are we ready to meet them? If we say we are ready, praise God. But it's more than the words we are uttering. It's the action that we are doing. Are we going to do? Right? Praise God for all of people who give their time and repent to God. So that all the things that Brother Eric shared today, we will, we will embrace it. God is powerful. He is mighty in each and every one of us. Right? If you want to experience the peace in, in, in you, the joy in your life, the answer is Jesus Christ. We need to give ourselves to the Lord. Everything that we have today, they are merely nothing if we don't have Christ in our life. It's, it's a temporary thing. And most people are lured with that. It's hard to let go of these things. But sadly, this is more important than Jesus Christ. But if we have personal relationship with the Lord, if we have personal conviction, if we give our time to the Lord, 
all these things will be forever. Remember, we will all die and leave these things behind. But the eternity that God promised us, if we embrace it, we will receive it. Remember, when Jesus Christ died at the cross beside him, this robber, this person surrendered to the Lord and asked God, asked Jesus Christ to be with them. You know what Jesus did? You will be you will be seated beside. See how God really changed your life in an instant if you surrender. That's the only that's the only thing we can do. I know it's hard, and it's hard when we love most that we have here on earth. It is hard. For some of us, it's easy for us to say, but no, we experience it. But it's more powerful because the Lord will empty you. Just to let you know, if you surrender yourself to the Lord, all the things that you have in this world will be nothing. He will take it away. Remember when you when you, when Eric said it today, <laughs> close. The Lord wants to be close. You want the Lord to be close to you. Huh, he will take everything that you have because all we need is Him simple as that but He will bless you He will give you everything that you need because God is a merciful God God is a gracious God God is a generous God all the promises that He said to all of us are still offering in our table all we need to do is accept him it's easy you guys listening to what we are saying but if you don't put it in your heart it's merely nothing we're not saying this because we are saying this it's because God is saying this if you want to attest to it and prove that read the word period like I said, brothers and sisters, we want you to be strong in the faith of what God has given to all of us. I know it's difficult, but like Brother Eric said, it's a lifestyle. It's not just in an instant. You have to work on it. Remember, there's no work that's is, that are easy. Even in your job, right? For you to be prosper, to, to have the you have to work it out, right? Same thing with the Lord. Same thing with our faith in God. Well, the question is, the message today: Are you ready, or are you willing, right? You speak, you ask God. The answer is not on us; it's in God have a relationship with the Lord. Amen? So let us all stand. And I would like to call on the music team to sing the last song. Thank you, Brother Eric. It's an eye-opener for all of us, I know. And for, all, for people who accepted today, praise God for your life. But it's not just starting point here. When you go home, pray to God. Surrender to God and repent. Amen? Let's pray, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord God. Truly, Lord God, this is the time for all of us, Lord God. We need to act now, Lord God. Because faith without action is dead. If we say we have faith in you, we will do it mightily, Lord God. Whatever the cost, as long as you are in our life, I know we will suffer. Same thing you suffer, Lord God. But all these things, we will reap, Lord God, the eternal life. And I pray, Lord God, for your people, Lord God. Touch their hearts, Lord God. All the things that we heard today, it is true. And it's just alive, Lord God, because you are alive. You are a God, nothing else. Other than that, they're small gods. But you are the only God. 
You are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Lord God. And it will never ever fail, Lord God. Your words will not fade, Lord God. We will, fa we will fail, Lord God, but your words will not, Lord God. Hallelujah, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God, for today. May your Holy Spirit be upon us to rebuke us, correct us, train us, Lord God, so that we will do the work of what you started, but your son started 300 years ago, Lord God. Thank you, Lord God. Just want to give back the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. All right, let's receive the blessing. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord shine on you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord show you his favor and keep you his eternal peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. See you next week. Let's sing the last song. Let's sing. Sorry. God's so loud.